The 6 o'clock news starts right now. After complaints about huge delays, Governor Greg Abbott ending a secondary inspection by Texas DPS at a checkpoint for commercial trucks. However, this will only be at one border crossing. The Texas Department of Public Safety will continue to thoroughly inspect vehicles entering into the United States from every Mexican state except Nuevo Leon. Now, the one location with the exception is the Laredo Columbia Solidarity International Bridge. Governor Abbott is there today and signed a deal with the governor of Nuevo Leon in Mexico, who vowed to enhance security measures on their side of the border. Meanwhile, at the other International Bridge locations, massive delays and protests have been going on. This all happening for the past week. Drivers of commercial vehicles have undergone secondary inspections by troopers of the Texas Department of Public Safety. Drivers say it is too slow of a process and costing both sides of the border a lot of money. We are continuing our, our coverage of that backup in the Rio Grande Valley. Our Alicia Barrera is live at the FAR International Bridge. She spoke with drivers who've waited for more than 10 hours to complete their jobs. That as we're learning what's happening on the Mexico side of the border, Alicia. Good afternoon. Well, just less than an hour ago, we received confirmation from Customs Border Protection that that blockade in Reynosa is over. What that means is that the drivers have moved out of the way and allowed cargo traffic to make their way past the far international bridge. But here's the thing. The thing DPS will continue their state inspections. What's usually a short three hour trip to the U.S has come to a screeching halt. Just yesterday, Eduardo Villanueva says he waited 14 hours to cross the Progreso International Bridge, where truck drivers are blocking the border on the Mexican side. Reynaldo Arenas tells me his two trips a day from Reynosa are now cut down to one, if he's lucky. But at the far International Bridge, Mariceli Pedrosa, who was vacationing with family, wasn't allowed to leave the U.S. after all lanes were closed until about 4 p.m. And it stems to road blockades and protests to the commercial vehicle inspections by DPS. As of April 11th, DPS reports more than 3,400 have been inspected. About 800 commercial vehicles and nearly 80 drivers have been placed out of service, with a total of 11,566 violations cited. As for the drivers, when asked if they're willing to make the trip back again, the majority say there's no other option. The truck drivers say on average the inspection by DPS takes about 45 minutes, which is unlike anything they're used to. But this is a line. These are some of the first commercial trucks to finally make it through that blockade. Again, it was just lifted less than an hour ago. And this is where they're being expected, inspected by DPS here at FAR, at the, in the city of FAR. All right, Alicia, I have a question about all this. Things moving now where you are, they're not in other places. Produce importers, the first to feel this economic impact. How soon before this affects people's pocketbooks here in San Antonio and Texas? So today I actually spoke to an avocado importer and he says already, already people can expect to feel the the hit in their pockets because the wholesale prices are already higher. So this means that restaurants or other clients, they're going to have to increase their prices as well. Some distributors we spoke to say they only have about a week worth of product left. Let that sink in just a week left. So although this traffic is moving, it's moving very slowly. There is hope for them, but there is no assurance that their product will make it still in good condition. Reporting from FAR, Alicia Barrera, KSAT 12 News. Yeah, chances are we're already feeling it. Thank you, Alicia. Meanwhile, scan this QR code to learn about another huge factor in what's happening along the border. We're talking about Title 42. It affects asylum seekers coming into the U.S. and it's set to end next month. If you have questions about what it is and how it works, we have a KSAT Explains episode diving into just that. This QR code will take you right to that show. Earlier this year, Bear County courts were approved to have two additional judges help with a big backlog in domestic violence cases. In less than two months, that backlog has been cut by half. It's 
more than a thousand cases that have already been resolved. Erica Hernandez spoke with the two judges who took on that effort to resolve these cases. She tells us why they say their system is working. In early February, Bear County Court 8 Judge Mary Roman and County Court 11 Judge Tommy Stolhansky were tasked with the tall order. They took on more than 2,600 cases that were part of the domestic violence backlog. It's been a lot of work on uh, not just mm -hmm. Judge Roman and myself, but on uh, our staff, on the district attorney's office, on the defense attorneys. Since then, they have been able to cut that backlog by about 60 percent. Their formula was to make sure all cases were set within 45 days to get both sides talking with each other. We just had to get them set and figure out what needed to be done on the case and hold them accountable to show up and hold them accountable to talk to each other and and try to come up with a resolution that was fair to everybody. Yeah, make sure that they understand that this is a backlog and they don't have two years to take care of their cases. And just getting both sides to meet has been successful in either having cases dismissed, settled or ready for trial. Based on the statistics, I think that we've given a lot of people that opportunity to have justice, whatever that was for either side. And the work will continue. Both judges, along with visiting judges, will continue to tackle that backlog with hopes of eliminating it. Erica Hernandez, Case at 12 News. Now, domestic violence in Bear County is the focus of an episode of Case That Explains. And today, that episode won a national award. We're going to share part of that show with you coming up at 630. The chilling stories of two women who went from domestic violence victims to survivors coming up at 630. A man police say is connected to multiple robberies downtown has now been arrested. 19 year old Eric Dwayne Caulfield was arrested yesterday and charged with aggravated robbery. Bear County jail records show that he was booked into the jail Tuesday. In the most recent robbery, police say Caulfield targeted a man waiting for a food delivery downtown. That was about one o'clock in the morning. Police say the suspect and two others approached the victim with a gun and then demanded his belongings. An affidavit shows that suspect's vehicle is believed to be connected to five other robberies. Caulfield's bond is now set at $75,000. The police are asking for your help in identifying two men who allegedly shot at a truck. It happened February 23rd in the parking lot of Big Bib Barbecue. That's on Lanark Drive near 410 and Austin Highway. Authorities say two men got out of this truck, started shooting at that other vehicle. If you recognize them or have any information that could help police, you're asked to call Crime Stoppers at 210-224-STOP. Have you opened yours yet? Appraisals are through the roof across San Antonio, about an average of 28% higher. Many people informed of this through that letter sent in the mail. Garrett Berger tells us that that's helped bring property tax relief to the forefront in San Antonio budget discussions. Garrett. That's right, Myra, specifically homestead exemptions. Now, that's a tool that you can be given to actually reduce the taxable value of your home so you pay less in taxes on it. Now, the city has a flat homestead exemption rate right now that's just the minimum amount, $5,000 across the board. But listening to council members talk about their budget priorities today, it seems pretty likely that they could raise that. Property appraisals have gone out to the dismay of many homeowners, even elected ones. Did you get one, Councilman? I got one, but I'm scared to open it. District 10's Clayton Perry and District 9's John Courage tried to bump up the city's homestead exemption last year, but didn't have the support. Now, though, it appears more colleagues are singing their tune. We need a bigger homestead exemption than we've got right now. Um, whatever that looks like, um, I, I don't know. The maximum council can do is a 20% exemption on the value of your home. City staff is recommending at least 5%. When in periods of this rising value like this, it is going to be easier to implement a homestead exemption and provide that leaf to our to our residents. The state caps how much extra property tax revenue the city can bring in compared to the year before. Because of ballooning appraisals, San Antonio is already projected to blow past that limit. So they have to reduce the revenue somehow. So this does make it easier to implement a, a homestead exemption, and as well as uh, lowering the tax rate also. That's, that's on the table as well. So I'm in favor of both. To make a bigger homestead exemption apply to your tax bill this year, council needs to pass it before July. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News.
The passion play is making a comeback this Friday. Today, organizers explaining what we can expect. The prayer service at Milam Park, procession to San Fernando Cathedral, ending with the crucifixion reenactment. A change this year, though, is the procession route due to construction in the area. The event returning also special for the actors who each have their own reasons for taking part. Had a friend come to my door, <laughs> sit down and talk to me and asked me if I wanted to play the role. At first I said no. The Passion Play will be broadcast on television and on Facebook. For more information, head to ksat.com. Another event a lot of people cherish. Mm -hmm. Nice to see it making a return. All right, look outside with live cam right now. That humidity's hanging on and the heat is on out there, Adam. Yeah, the heat definitely on. Topped out at 98 degrees today. Right now, we're still at 93, so we're feeling the warmth out there. Dew point of 36, very dry air. That's one reason why we got so warm today. That dry air heats up very efficiently, but it wasn't that hot everywhere. You look farther to the north in Texas, 60s and 70s right now. Actually, a weak cool front moved through a bit ago, and that's why we have those cooler airs, the cooler temperatures in the cooler air farther to the north. Cotulo, though, 101. Uvalde, 94 degrees, 93 New Braunfels. And as we go through the evening, temperatures falling off pretty quickly. I mean, mid 70s by 10 o'clock tomorrow morning, actually a little below average. We'll tell you how cool and where in just a little bit and see if there's any hope of rain coming right up. Thank you, Adam. Happening tonight at 7, Stephanie Jimenez and I will be talking mental health and suicides in teenagers. It's part of our new episode, a breakdown with hashtag Steph and Steve. You can hear from local high school students who discuss their struggles with mental health, along with how experts say is the best way for parents and loved ones to help. It's right after the show at seven o'clock. We mentioned it a moment ago, domestic violence in Bear County happening at an alarmingly high rate. Our KSAT Explains team has an episode focused on protective orders. We're going to share that with you coming up. With the latest COVID-19 variant, BA.2 variant rising across the U.S., the CDC warning people to stay vigilant. Some people worrying about mask mandates returning in some places they already are. What local health officials have to say about this. Let's take a look at traffic right now. The Trans Guide camera here at I-10 and Woodstone. You can see there's an accident right there on the main lanes. Looks like one whole section, one whole direction of I-10 is blocked off. Uh, emergency vehicles there on the scene. We'll try to get some more information about what's happening, but certainly something to back up traffic at 6 o'clock at I-10 and Woodstone. Welcome back. I'm Stefania Jimenez, and here's what we're working on for you tonight on the Night Beat. Feeling the backup at the border right here in San Antonio. The trucker protest down in Mexico appears to be over. Why produce businesses here say there could be a ripple effect. Also, the effort to bring a former San Antonio resident home. Here, Paul Rusi, Rusi Sabagina inspired the movie Hotel Rwanda, how his family says he ended up overseas and why they're worried about his well-being. Also, get ready to mask up on your next flight out of town because the federal mask mandate has been extended. We're going to talk about the reason behind the TSA's latest decision. See you for these stories and a lot more tonight on The Night Beat. Thank you, Stephanie. And now to COVID cases rising across the country, especially in many Northeast states. It's a reminder that the virus is still present despite many of us getting back to normal. RJ Marquez spoke with San Antonio Metro Health about our current outlook and a new subvariant spreading quickly. It might feel a little bit like deja vu. COVID cases up across the country, leading to questions about mass mandates and another wave of infections. Just want to point out loud and clear that this virus is still not done with us. Dr. Anita Kurian says San Antonio Metro Health has been watching closely as case numbers have ticked up in the Northeast. Here at home, the community-wide risk level and hospitalizations remain low, but Metro Health is still seeing on average about 65 to 70 new cases every day. We've been at this low risk level. We've had dark, uh, positivity rates less than 1.5% in the past. And then we have seen things take a turn for the worse. According to the CDC, the primary cause of this uptick in cases nationally is the BA2 Omicron subvariant. 86% of the newly sequenced uh, cases uh, are BA, BA.2. It may not cause more severe infections than your Omicron variant in the past, 
but it seemed to be spreading a little bit more faster. As this new subvariant spreads, Metro Health wants people to stay vigilant. Get tested if you're exposed to someone with COVID or is showing COVID symptoms. And most important, get vaccinated or a booster shot. Vaccine immunity seems to be waning, so it's very important that each one of us, even, we, even if you're fully vaccinated, get all those booster dose recommendations. And while some cities and large universities are reinstating indoor mask mandates, Dr. Kurian said Metro Health is cautiously optimistic they will not have to do that, but not relaxing recommendations. Once we start those indicators move up into orange or high levels, um, we may have to rethink our strategies. RG Marquez, KSAT 12 News. Check out weather outside, 93 degrees out there. It is a warm one, but... You know, <laughs> what are you, you know, going to do? April? There's, there's, it, there's nothing right. we can do because, you know, we need rain. We're, we're trying. Yeah, we're trying. And Sunday night and even a little bit yesterday evening, we had a few showers, mainly on the north side of town. There was a little bit of activity, but that's that doesn't really make much of a difference. And what doesn't help us out either is full sunshine and 98 degrees for the high temperature today. That's two degrees shy of the record, which was set back in 1932, 1982, that is 1982. The average high, 80 degrees. Pleasanton made it to 101, Catula 103. Those were the hot spots today. Take a look at our temperature trend, though. Not as hot the next few days. We'll actually have high temperatures down in the mid 80s. So we're going to be uh, not quite as warm as what we've been experiencing, but still above average for this time of year. And then we spike a little bit into the weekend. Currently still 101 Catula, 94 Uvalde, 93 New Braunfels, Kerrville, 88 degrees. We're feeling the warmth out there. Port SA, 93. Stinson did hit 100, now at 98. And Converse at 92 degrees. By tomorrow morning, though, it's going to be noticeably cooler, actually running below average with temperatures mostly in the lower 50s. Castroville, 53. Seguin at 50. You get into the hill country and we'll have some readings down on the 40s. Bandera Pipe Creek about 46. Comfort down to 43 tomorrow morning. Those unseasonably cool mornings aren't going to last very long. They just can't this time of year. And so by Friday, back closer to 60. And then this weekend with the return of humidity, morning temperatures are back in the upper 60s at that point. Looking at the activity out there, a little bit left over earlier today of shower and thunderstorm activity in parts of East Texas, but quiet in our neck of the woods, of course. We had just a little bit of uh, showers and storms yesterday afternoon and evening about this time. And the big picture shows there's that action out there. There's a dynamic weather pattern. It's a very spring like weather pattern with storm systems, severe weather right now in parts of the mid south and along the Mississippi Valley and snow on the cold side of it up to 30 inches possible in parts of North Dakota. Yes, it's active. It's just unfortunately not active around here. We don't have that activity in place, but this is a far stretching big system, double barrel low pressure system. And if you look at the future cast, this is very generic, but generally speaking over the next five to seven days, you look at the pre precipitation output from the models, Notice it's still southeastern United States and a little bit along the northern tier and the Pacific Northwest around here. We just have a small chance Saturday 20% by Sunday 30% and that's in the afternoon and evening. So nothing to change your Easter plans around Easter morning. It'll be just fine and you, know, you can't get your hopes hopes up when you're just looking at a 20 to 30% chance and that's both Saturday and Sunday. That's when the humidity returns right now. Dew points in the 30s that dry air is in place, but that's going to change not so much tomorrow, but as we get on into Friday and this upcoming weekend. Nothing but sunshine tomorrow. We talked about temperatures only making it into the mid 80s, so not as hot as the past few days and this weekend back in the low to mid 90s with that humidity. Alrighty, thank you, Adam. All right, we are roughly two hours away from game time mm. and it could be the last game of the year, could be the start of a run. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And the Spurs actually defeated the Pelicans in New Orleans now two times this season. Can they make it a third time when we come back? It's win or go home. Our Larry Ramirez is courtside to get us ready for the big game. And what do the Cowboys and cryptocurrency have in common? Find out coming up. Our 
Uh, San Antonio Spurs and New Orleans tonight tip off the play-in tournament against the Pelicans. If they win, they would advance to the second round of the play-in tournament against the Clippers in Los Angeles on Friday after they lost to the Timberwolves in Minnesota last night. That would be for the eighth and final playoff position in the Western Conference. Well, let's not get ahead of ourselves. The Spurs have been here before last year when they lost their first playing game against Memphis as a result, missed the playoffs for the second straight season. That has never happened in franchise history. Now they would like to make up for that tonight in also what could be the Spurs head coach Greg Popovich's final game. With all that swirling around, let's take a lie to the Smoothie King Center in New Orleans, and that's where we find our Larry Ramirez. Hi, Larry. Hello, Greg, and welcome to the Big Easy, everybody. So we really have no clue what the future holds for Spurs head coach Greg Popovich, other than he does have one more game to coach tonight right here in New Orleans. It is win or go home. It's called play-in tournament time. So the Spurs held shoot-around this morning right here at the Smoothie King Center. Pop spent a majority of his time sitting on the scorer's table and standing on the court watching his guys with that laser focus of his. For 19-year-old Joshua Primo, Pop's youngest player on the roster, this is a special night for him. The winner go home mentality is just like the NCAA men's basketball tournament that Josh played in last season at Alabama. How is the teenager approaching this game? I navigate it like I always have. I feel like I've always been the youngest uh, anywhere I played. I always played up as a kid. Um, even playing on the national team, I, I played up. I, it's just something that I'm used to. I see everyone as just a basketball player. I don't see age out there on the court. So, um, players just going to play. So, everything goes up from here in terms of just the intensity. So, uh, I think I'm just excited. He should be excited. We are still some two hours away from tip Spurs and Pels tonight at 8.30. So if the Spurs win, of course, we, the media, will be heading to Los Angeles for more coverage. Greg, back to you. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Thank you, Larry. You'll have some flights to book. The Dallas Cowboys have become the first NFL team to have a cryptocurrency partnership. This after Cowboys owner Jerry Jones announced a deal with blockchain and the co-founder and CEO Peter Smith at a press conference at the Star in Frisco today. And the business of football wasn't far from Jerry's mind. He was asked if the Cowboys would trade up from the 24th spot of the upcoming draft. I would trade up uh, this draft um, and uh, just going in as much as you can say about it until you see what's there, or who's on the other end of the line. But uh, yeah, I would trade up to uh, since we're down as low as we are in those first two or three rounds. The Houston Texans have two first round draft picks this year, the third overall and the 13th, thanks to the trade with Cleveland for quarterback Deshaun Watson. But there is no indication that either of them will be used for a quarterback. Not if you listen to new head coach Lovey Smith. Davis is our quarterback, so that's one thing about leadership. In order to lead, you got to you got to show up. You got to be here. They have to see you in every situation, and not just on the football field. I'm definitely comfortable. I think the biggest thing with being a leader for the team just starts with showing up every day, um, showing the team that you're you're here to put in work. Um, I think people mention a lot just the quarterback's role as a vocal leader, and I mean I think that comes with the position. Texans organized team activities begin May 23rd. Mandatory minicamp starts on June the 14th. And the UIL soccer tournament state semifinals in Class 4A. Bernie Greyhounds fall to Salina 3-0. There's still two more schools in that area. Champion and also Bernie girls will still have to play as well. So good luck to those teams tomorrow. And good luck to the Spurs tonight. You got that right. Yeah. Thanks, Greg. Case that explains is up next. Today, we are pleased to announce some much-deserved recognition for our KSAT Explains team, Myra included. The show is the winner of a Gracie Award for Best Local TV News Magazine for an episode on the high rate of domestic violence in Bear County. It continues to be a problem. We focused on protective orders for this show, what they can do and how to get one, plus what help is available, what's out there yeah. right now. We want to share part of that episode here tonight, the story of two survivors who found a way out. It was uh, late 2016 when we met each other. He took me home to meet his mom, and turns out his mom was my parents' landlord. It's very subtle at first. Um, abusers gift wrap it. They 
they give it to you in this pretty package so you don't realize it. They start to isolate you, but you don't realize it's isolation. If I'm gonna go with my sister, he would be like, well, why do you have to go with your sister? You're with her all the time. I wanna spend time with you. People stop inviting you to things because you're never going. I had no control of any financials, no control of anything. You know, the fact that his mom was my parents' land, landlady. When we would get into arguments, he would always kind of throw out, well, now your parents are gonna be homeless. The physical abuse just like whew, escalated. The abuse got worse to the point of strangulation. He held a shotgun to my stomach. Strangling me um, to the point where I black out, biting me, ripping out my hair. And they escalated in the beginning, they weren't like that. You know, it was just like a smack here, a push here, a bump there, and as sad as it is, is that it was actually encouraged by his father um, to put me in my place. Nearly 30 years. Nearly 30 years. Then there was another huge incident, and at that time again, the chain of command was involved, and they informed me, where are you going to go? You already have another child on the way. You don't have, you know, a very high education. It's best to um, learn to deal with it. I reached out to local authorities on numerous occasions. I was even told that um, it was my fault, that it is because I keep dropping the charges, and I was like, no, that's the court's decision. That is not my decision. Due to COVID and us having to be home in the lockdown, it put us in, so to speak, a lion's den. You know, there, we weren't able to escape the children were home and I had to be home because in good conscience I could not leave my children alone with him. It is chaotic now, but it's peaceful. I don't feel like I'm walking on glass. My children, there's laughter in the house. There's dancing in the house. The way Elizabeth escaped her abuser was an incredibly close call. She says that he was high on drugs that day, paranoid that someone was watching their home. He told her to pack their car because they were leaving. She says that's when she saw an opportunity. She loaded that car so full that their kids couldn't fit. He said he was leaving to drop off those belongings somewhere else and he would be back. The second he pulls out of that driveway, I grab my kids. I walked down to a friend's house. So my six-year-old, I left with a friend. It was gonna be easier to get away with just the baby. I was like, he's gone. I need to grab the birth certificates for the kids. I need to grab some clothes. I need to grab diapers for the baby. I need to grab some essentials. So we get back home. I start barricading the front door. I start packing everything and putting everything outside the back door. I go next door to the neighbor. I asked her to borrow the phone. The only phone number that I had memorized was my cousin's. I called my cousin, my cousin was in New Braunfels. She was like, I'll be there as soon as I can, it's rush hour. He had turned back. He said he had a feeling. He turned back early and he caught me leaving. So when a victim is leaving, she's in the most danger. He stabbed me that day, he choked me. He cavity searched me. At this point, the baby is seven weeks old, barely seven weeks old. He grabs the baby and he starts to take off. We start going back and forth fighting because I'm trying to take the baby from him. Well, he puts the baby's head into the wall. The baby had been screaming up to that point because obviously he has all this stimulation, right? The baby stopped. Like there was no stimulation at all. And that scared the crap out of me and it scared him too enough for him to 
and I grabbed the baby from him. And at that point, I didn't care. I ran toward the street. And like to this day, <laughs> it puts a lump in my throat because I ran to the street. And my cousin was three houses down. And she saw me and she sped up. And she threw the door open and I jumped in the car. And we left. I'm not a victim anymore, I'm a survivor. All you can do is fight and fight and fight and then end up on the other side. Because it is beautiful on the other side. If you don't do it now, when? When for yourself and when for your children? Because, you know, the circumstances could have been very different for me. I could possibly not even be sitting here. Both of those survivors got to where they are today with the help of local agencies and organizations. And that is a key part of this Case That Explains episode. There is help out there right now. Yeah, if nothing else, no, there is help. To watch the full show, scan this QR code with your phone. We talk about the resources available, how to get a protective order, what it does, and we talk to the people who are dedicated to helping victims become survivors. You can watch this episode on demand anytime. We'll be right back. Welcome back. The manhunt is over for the suspect accused of opening fire on a New York City subway train yesterday morning. Ten people shot during that terrifying incident. Here is Gloria Pasmino with the latest on the investigation and what we're learning about that suspect. New York City police say they've arrested 62-year-old Frank James, the man they now call a suspect in Tuesday's subway shooting. James spoke heavily about violence in multiple rambling videos posted online, including what appears to be his latest video posted just one day before the shooting. I wanted to kill people. I wanted to watch people die right in front of my face immediately. But I thought about the fact that, hey man, I don't want to go to no prison. The videos posted by James give some insight into his trip to New York City. In one of the videos, James says he left his home in Wisconsin on March 20th and was heading to the, quote, danger zone. We need to see more mass shootings. Yeah, you need to not know. We need to see more. There has to be more mass shootings. Police say James rented this U-Haul van on April 11th in Philadelphia. The U-Haul was found in Brooklyn Tuesday after keys to the vehicle were found at the scene of the subway attack. Investigators also linking the gun found at the scene to James and tracking the purchase of a gas mask to James through eBay. That's according to law enforcement officials. The manhunt for James may be over, but the healing for victims is just beginning. I still feel the pain. Um, they gave me a bunch of pain meds, but I, it's still there. I can still feel it. I can still see the hole. I don't think I'm going to ever, I don't think I can ever ride the train again. In Brooklyn, I'm Gloria Pasmino. We got a solid dose of heat here in South Texas today as we head towards a holiday weekend. Definitely got a solid dose. We don't need a booster. <laughs> no, we don't need another no. booster. It's not recommended in this department. Yes, <laughs> it's not. And it's not going to be quite as hot the next couple of days. We made it to 98 for the high temperature today here in town, missing the record by only two degrees. And yesterday we actually tied the record high in the mid 90s. I believe yesterday we made it up to 94, 94, not as hot tomorrow or the following day either on Friday. Humidity does return on Good Friday and then some slight rain and storm chances as we get into the weekend. Take a look at those shower and thunderstorm chances. Don't get your hopes up. We're talking 20 to 30 percent Saturday afternoon. A few rogue pop up showers or brief storms could happen. 20 percent chance there Sunday, a 30 percent chance for the afternoon and evening hour. Sunday we could have a little more help from a very weak front that could be moving into town, so up to 30%. And then middle of next week, Wednesday, 20%. A lot of rain in parts of East Texas yesterday, and even just north of our area, you get between Killeen, Dallas, Tyler, Texarkana, Lufkin, that's where we had some healthy rain. Of course, it came at a cost, actually. Uh, near Salado in Bell County, a confirmed EF3 tornado, 165 mile per hour winds, 
yesterday. Again, that was Southern Bell County, far to the north of us, but just shows you uh, how dangerous the weather was yesterday in other parts of the Lone Star State. But they did pick up some decent rainfall on the order of two to four inches just north of Lufkin. That rain moved out the active weather. Now it's pushing east of the Mississippi River. It has been throughout the day today. These red boxes indicate tornado watch boxes. Yellow indicating severe thunderstorm watch boxes already active severe weather there. It's another classic spring system stretches from the Gulf of Mexico all the way into Canada. On the cold side of it, you see the blue snow, heavy wet snow. We're talking 20 to 30 inches in parts of North Dakota because it's just sitting and pivoting right over central North Dakota. So this is a big far reaching system. It's dynamic out there, just not here, unfortunately. And we dried out a lot. Actually, we had the little weak cold front move through and that dropped our dew points down into the 30s. So dry air back in place. Luckily, the winds are really diminishing and dying down. So we're not expecting that enhanced fire threat overnight tonight. And tomorrow's not going to be overly gusty either. But bottom line is we need rain. It doesn't matter. We still just need the rain. Dew points back into the 60s by Friday. So you'll feel that stickiness and it's going to last through the upcoming weekend before we see that humidity fall off a little bit. First thing next week on Monday. All right, let's talk temperatures. Still 101 Catula. That's the hot spot on the map. Gonzales 91, New Braunfels 93, Hondo 95. Bernie 86, Canyon Lake at 88, and Stinson now at 98. But tomorrow morning, we're going to be running below average. We're talking lower 50s for most of us. And into the hill country, some 40s. So even Bulverde and Bernie 46, Comfort 43 tomorrow morning. Lost Maples, Utopia area at about 48 degrees. The rest of us lower 50s. And then by the afternoon, we're not talking 90s. I mean, near 90 degrees south of Highway 90, Divine, Poteet 89, Pleasanton 90. But around San Antonio, we're thinking mostly in the mid 80 or mid 80s for high temperatures. So we go from the lower 50s in the morning, nothing but sunshine on into the low to mid 80s as we get into the afternoon. And notice that wind out of the southeast, only about 10 to 15 miles per hour. So not overly gusty or windy on your Thursday. If we get into the weekend, there's that slight chance of storms. Again, 20% Saturday afternoon, 30% Easter Sunday afternoon and evening. And high temperatures back in the low to mid 90s. So you'll feel the humidity and a li little bit more warmth. Some people would call it heat. That's, <laughs> that's all subjective as we get into the weekend. It, it all right. Depends on the month. You know, I get it. <laughs> it yeah. Depends Thanks, on yeah. what's average. Yeah, we'll be right back. Following some late breaking news right now, this is more information about a crash on I-10 on the northwest side where two people were taken to a hospital. Look at these images here. This happened around 5 o'clock this evening near De Zavala and UTSA. We showed you a live picture from the TransGuide camera earlier in this newscast. Now details of what led up to the crash unknown at this time, but photos here you can see one vehicle caught fire. We're going to continue to update you on this developing story as we gather more information, both right here on air and on KSAT.com. It's Wednesday the 13th. Thanks for joining us today. San Antonio police are investigating the deaths of a man and a woman found under a bridge on the city's northwest side. A San Antonio police spokesperson says some of the passing through the area made that discovery underneath the bridge in the 5400 block of Evers Road. Now, police say there was evidence that the man and woman believed to be in their 30s or 40s were living in the drainage ditch. The blockade on the Mexican side, so we're talking about Reynosa with the far international bridge, that has since been lifted. So what's happening right now is that those truck drivers, some who have been waiting since Saturday to get through into the U.S. to drop off their produce, they're finally able to make it through. But not everything has changed. DPS is still going to carry out their state mandate mandated inspections um, at a 100% capacity. An update now on a crash that we told you about yesterday along I-35. Police say the man who died in this case is 53-year-old Richard Cadena. He crashed somewhere near Somerset and Casson Lane yesterday morning. Investigators think that he hit an 18-wheeler there. 
With Easter coming up, a tradition returning to San Antonio's San Fernando Cathedral. The Passion Play is back this Friday, but there will be a few changes. The event starts with a prayer service at Milam Park, and then there'll be a procession to San Fernando. This year, it's gonna follow a new route it's due to the construction of Della Rosa. When you get to the cathedral, that procession is gonna end with the crucifixion reenactment. That's at noon on Friday. <laughs> just a few minutes away from a new episode of Breakdown with Steph and Steve. They're standing by in the newsroom right now. And guys, tonight the focus is an important one, mental health and teenagers. Right, it's something that we have seen so many teenagers suffering during this pandemic, you know, with feelings of isolation. But part of the issue is that there was an amazing statistic coming out of the CDC that said that since the pandemic, hospital admissions for teenage girls who may have attempted suicide have gone up by 50 percent, and that's across the country. So we're going to break this down for you tonight. Yeah, and one in three teenage girls and one in five teenage boys have experienced new or worsening anxiety mm -hmm. since March of 2020. So those are sobering statistics mm -hmm. for anybody, but especially parents or loved ones of a teenager. What can you do? What are some solutions? We're going to talk about all that coming up in about 10 seconds or so. Uh, on KSAT.com and all the streaming platforms for KSAT. So join us on the conversation online with hashtag Steph and Steve if you have any questions during the discussion. And we'll see you on the night beat at 10.